Hey everybody, John Stewart here. I am here to tell you about my new podcast, The Weekly Show, coming out every Thursday. We're going to be talking about the uh, election, earnings calls. What are they talking about on these earnings calls? We're going to be talking about ingredient to bread ratio on sandwiches. I know you have a lot of options as far as podcasts go, but how many of them come out on Thursday? Listen to The Weekly Show with John Stewart wherever you get your podcasts. Make this new school year an opportunity for your kids to learn important life skills with Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app for families where kids learn how to save, invest, and spend wisely while parents keep an eye on kids' money habits. Greenlight also helps families get into their fall routine with a chores feature that lets parents assign chores and pay kids allowance when they check them off. Get your first month free at greenlight.com slash Spotify. Greenlight.com slash Spotify. Hey, it's Sarah. Before we dive into this episode, I wanted to let you know that a Spanish version of this episode is now available for your enjoyment. Just search Nationly en Español wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Vice President Kamala Harris was in Chicago this past week to accept her party's nomination for the presidency. She was met head-on with voters protesting the Biden-Harris administration's aid to Israel. President Biden has funded Israel during its war against Hamas. According to Gaza health officials, around 40,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. The deadly conflict has not stopped since October 7th. Now, pro-Palestinian protesters are looking for a public promise from Harris to end aid. A coalition of around 200 social justice organizations marched at the DNC on Monday. In this episode, we'll hear on-the-ground coverage from our producer, Sofia Sanchez, who reported from Chicago at the DNC. But first, we're turning to Noor Saudi, a Palestinian-American journalist who has been outspoken about the killing of Palestinian civilians. Welcome to Nationly, Noor. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So, Noor, it's great to see you again. I want to start talking about your Palestinian roots and give you space to talk about how or if you have been personally affected by the humanitarian crisis in Palestine. Thank you for that. So as a Palestinian journalist, Palestine, the sole issue that brought me into journalism, being young and in school and seeing how you couldn't really even talk about what was happening in Palestine. You couldn't talk about the occupation. The media wasn't covering it nearly as much as they are now. And what can you imagine 20 years ago? Both my parents were born in Palestine, from Jerusalem. My grandma, she's older than the state of Israel. My dad fled in 1967 during the war um, at that time and then returned. And then eventually my parents immigrated to uh, the U.S. in the 70s just for more opportunity. As a Palestinian, when you go back now, even in Jerusalem, like there's checkpoints everywhere. You have to have your visa and your passport on you at all times. You could be stopped and questioned. You could be detained, which I've been anytime I've gone. It's what the international community has called an apartheid system. Multiple human rights organizations have all agreed on that. Seeing the framing of the occupation and not calling it out as it is, all of that made me want to go into journalism, want to be a part of changing that narrative. And then the last 10 months has just upended all of that. You know, I've never felt grief uh, at this level before. Like it's indescribable seeing how not just like the mass slaughter of, of people, Palestinians in Gaza, but seeing the journalists that are our own colleagues that have been killed for, we're in like the 11th month now of genocide and seeing the very industry that I wanted to come into in framing it, killing of our colleagues. So there's a lot, a lot of feelings of grief, a lot of feelings of like questioning my place in this industry. Nothing's getting better. Right now, as you said, we're in the 11th month of this conflict. And as of now, there is around 160 journalists killed in Gaza, the worst uh, conflicts where most journalists have ever been killed in a conflict before. What do you think about the coverage of the Palestinian genocide from the U.S. perspective, specifically major media outlets? Like even this far in, you're still seeing headlines that are framing this almost as like both sides, right? Like we know what happened on October 7th, but that is almost being used as a way to justify the ongoing atrocities that we're seeing. Like last week we saw 
the bombing of the school in, in Gaza City that killed nearly 100 people. And then there was like a New York Times alert about it that was saying, you know, well, Israel said Hamas was there. But on the ground, all of the witnesses, journalists that were on the ground, the very few that are left there, the documented evidence we've seen have all said otherwise. They've they've confirmed that there was no presence of Hamas there, that these were all civilians that were killed. And if you saw any of the footage from that, it was like, you can't even explain, like you can't even describe, you can't even process what we were seeing because of the types of weapons that were used in that attack. And it's clear that it's like active dehumanization of Palestinians, like the fact that they're not seen as credible sources, right? This is the, their own genocide that they're experiencing, and yet they're not believed. There's always this, as this ministry is saying this, but Israel said that. And we're just going to give you, the reader, these two things, and you do with it what you will. As a reader, to me, it's like journalistic malpractice, right? It's like basics of journalism that learn that you're supposed to tell your reader or whoever is taking in this news, what's happening. And yet the framing of this is I'm just supposed to make my own decisions. But that's been ongoing 10 months in. And and hearing your perspective on that, I, I can't help but be reminded of, you know, times in the past uh, in which the United States has been a part of various conflicts. And just even in recent history, right, the U.S. invasion of Iraq based on this idea that there were weapons of mass destruction and the entire narrative that we have to do this to make the Middle East safe. And then it turned out there were no WMDs, Uh, even under Obama. Like one of the things that I uh, often teach in some of my courses is about like presidential overreach in in uh, and presidential power in times of conflict. And, you know, Obama pulled out of Afghanistan and Iraq, but put in drone strikes. And these drone strikes, you know, they were always said that they were going to be um, militant targets. And the result was always civilians, women, children. And I I do want to add this whole period of time has been a reflection on this industry and journalism. But it's also like scary when I think about reflecting on the upcoming election, right? And the fact that Trump is a very real reality. And a lot of the protesters that are calling out Kamala for not calling for an an arms embargo against Israel and that are going to that are protesting the DNC. They don't want another repeat of a Trump presidency. Like we've seen what he's done, especially when it comes to journalism, especially his attacks on the free press. But to me, I'm like, how do we not take that knowledge and see that the media right now is giving this rubber stamp to the genocide that's happening by the way it's covering it? And what does that mean for the future of journalism and the future of our industry to hold a leader accountable if we can't even call out the accountability in this current moment Um, and that there's pushback and there's blaming going around if you dare to call it out. And so, yeah, the fact that our colleagues are being slaughtered in Gaza and there's not this uh, mass condemnation of that, that's an indictment on our whole industry worldwide, not just in Gaza, not just in the U.S., but everywhere. It's a threat to press freedom everywhere. I understand that when we say media, we mean major media publications, because not all media covers it the same way. Yes, media takes a very big role on how these the stories told, but there's also good media, right? Yeah. I have so many colleagues at The New York Times, at CNN, who are like trying so hard to push for certain stories to be told. Like they go through hell to get these stories out um, of from Gaza. And it's hard. I look at it as more of a broader narrative of like institutionally what top editors, what the framing is, right? It's not about which individual journalists are telling these stories or the people who are there to ask the right questions, but more so who's making the decision on like the, the writing of this headline, the framing of this story. In the broader context, I mean, one of the things we hear so much about, especially with the DNC, is the protesters. But what I'm hearing from you, Noor, is that there's also a, a, a protest amongst journalists themselves. Um, to what extent do you feel like either you personally as a journalist or you perhaps as some group of journalists are a part of this protest movement. And, and, and what is this protest movement? Like, what is it, what does it really look like? Who are these protesters? What is it that they're truly asking for in this moment, right? Like, what is the ask in this moment? I mean, there's just simply the call to acknowledge the journalists in Gaza, acknowledge the slaughter that's happening there, condemning that, condemning what Israel's doing, calling it out as Israel's 
mass slaughter of these journalists, suppression of the media there, which like the Committee to Protect Journalists has done. I know, Juan Diego, you mentioned like 40,000. That's like even a modest number when you look at like the journals and studies like The Lancet have estimated that the, the number of Palestinians killed in Gaza is actually well over 186,000. Like we will never know until this stops and they can actually start counting bodies under the rubble that are still missing. And yeah, the main thing is a permanent immediate ceasefire. I think there's a little confusion when it comes to people like saying Kamala Harris has called for a ceasefire, right? I think there's a, a almost like a different definition that Democratic candidates and the Democratic Party is using when they say ceasefire. If you look at like the what they're calling for, it's more like a temporary six week ban and let's pause. It's more that language. What people within the movement are saying is, no, we want like an immediate and permanent ceasefire. This has to end. It can't continue. And calling for an end to sending weapons to Israel, right? An arms embargo. We are seeing our own tax dollars in the U.S. being used to pay for these weapons that are, like you said, like we're not, they're not killing who they're saying they, they're targeting. They're killing children and women and families and entire bloodlines of generations in, in Gaza. That's what we've been seeing ongoing, especially like knowing that it's our tax dollars, being a journalist and seeing what's happening, being a voter and seeing what the candidates are calling for, like all of these things. I mean, it all comes down to this has to end and they the Democrats have to take those calls serious. Yeah. Many voters have been like urging the DNC for a ceasefire and you know, arm, like you mentioned, arms em embargo. And protesters are not just like Palestinian uh, or Arab or Muslim. They're from all walks of life. So there's also thousands of Gen Zers, African-Americans, Latinos. So what have you noticed about the voters um, participating in like this strategy to, to call out the Democratic Party, even the Republican Party? Just like we're seeing at the DNC that there's a coalition of groups that are marching and have marched to protest this genocide. We saw the same thing in July. There were protests outside of the RNC calling for the same thing. The movement also knows that Democrats are more likely to be pushed on this issue. Trump has made it clear that he supports Israel no matter what. Like he said in a recent rally this week that this needs to end, but he also framed it as get your victory and go, which is to Netanyahu, victory is like wiping out everyone in Gaza, right? So it's like the language is very vague. But yeah, there have definitely been protests on both parties. What we're seeing at the DNC is um, understanding that this uncommitted movement came out specifically to urge and push Biden at first and now Kamala Harris on on calling for a ceasefire, on hearing the calls of the uncommitted movement. They started this back in the primaries, right? Like we saw the vote in Michigan win like 100,000 votes, which was pretty significant. And they were like, it's a serious movement. We saw it across multiple states in Wisconsin, et cetera. Democrats had months then. That's, that was in February, the Michigan primary. So they had months to really take these calls seriously. And we're now in August at the DNC and we're still seeing weapons being sent. We're still seeing weapons being approved to be sent to Israel. And we're still not seeing a ceasefire. Like there's news that comes out. Oh, talks are happening. But yeah, there's no actual movement. One of the things that I, I keep hearing a lot of chatter around is are uncommitted voters at the primary stage necessarily uncommitted to the general. And, and I'll say like, generally speaking, yes, it does, right? Like a lot of people don't even bother to participate in a primary because they, they they lack information or the stakes don't seem so high um, or maybe they don't have well-formed preferences. Um, so that's one piece, right? Like, do you anticipate that those folks who voted uncommitted in a primary are beginning to shift their mentality at all? Or is it, is it, is it, like sticky, right? Is it is it sticky and saying, no, we're still not going to do it? Honestly, I think that's a little hard to say, right? Like we rely on polling so much and then you don't really know until election day comes around. I know there there's definitely like with, with Kamala now in the race, there's this narrative that we have to just, she's better than Biden. She's not as old, right? <laughs> like she's, she seems to be aware of what's happening. And there's a narrative that we can't have a repeat of Trump. We just have to vote for Democrats for now, and then we can push them later once they're in office. I do think a lot of voters see through that. I think that's been a narrative that's been repeated in past elections, right? We've seen it in 2020, and then we've seen what Joe Biden has done during his term, which is carry out this genocide. And so I think it's, it's difficult to say. I, I think when it comes to Palestinian, Arab, Muslim voters, I don't foresee a majority of them coming out if there isn't a significant change in policy when in regards to Gaza. I don't see them coming out for Democrats. And at the DNC, there is the uncommitted delegation, right? They're not a, a big 
part of the vote. I think they're like less than 1%, but they are there just more representative, right? To represent Palestinians in Gaza, to represent and to be their presence to show that they are still um, concerned about this issue and, and concerned about the genocide. And I think they've the, that delegation has said if Kamala does make something, sig- a significant change in, in terms of Gaza, that they will back her. So it's, it's really like, it's to me, it feels unfair or it just feels like a lot of the framing falls back on the voters themselves. Oh, are you going to be responsible for what happens in November? Whereas like they're telling their candidates who are supposed to work for them, really, you're supposed to serve our citizens. You're supposed to re- represent us. They're telling you what they're asking for. And so really the onus should fall on the Democratic uh, Party and the de- Democratic candidates to listen and to do something about it. Actually, just on that point, according to polls, like there's 44 percent of registered Democrats that oppose Biden's handling of the war. So, like, why do you think the party has not worked to end their financial support on this war? This country has had a long standing alliance and and support of Israel. And I I think it's going to take a lot to pull back funding of, of Israel. I think there's interest, obviously, to have a state like Israel in the middle of the Middle East. And I think. There's a lot of also lobbyist groups. We know that for a fact. We saw Cori Bush lose her race, her primary race in, in Missouri because APAC heavily funded her opponent. And so I think like all of those factors play into why there's this continued support. And I think also Democrats are probably confident that they don't need these voters. Yeah, I, I just thinking of like in early August at, at the rally uh, for Kamala Harris, in the very same state that were uncommitted did so, right, in Michigan, where they were, you know, pro- protesting um, during her rally, she told them, I'm speaking, basically, like, be quiet, right? And then just on the other hand, like, her running mate, we saw Tim Walls, he refused to meet with a Palestinian family. So, like, they have time to address these voters, but it's like time and time again, they're being shown that they don't value them. But I also want to say that, on the other hand, she avoided Netis Yahoo on his last visit to the U.S. She avoided, but then she recently said also that she wouldn't support any policy that stops weapons to Israel. So I think, like, it's hard. A lot of people will say, like, she's been more empathetic to what's happening. But, you know, people have pulled, like, her and Joe Biden's statements on this issue for months and seeing that they pretty much overlap. So I think for a lot of these voters as well, knowing that Kamala Harris is currently a part of the Act, like the current administration that is actively um, carrying out what's happening in Israel and supporting it, they see her as part of that and they see her as complicit in that. And so it's hard for them to disconnect her from that reality and disconnect her from the Biden administration as she is the VP of it, you know? What are protesters and journalists doing to adjust the hearts and minds of everyday voters in addition to changing the policies of leadership? Because to some extent, leaders, even Democrats, are, are being reflective of this big tent that they're trying to represent. And the reality is there is a division even amongst Democrats in terms of how they think this that that our leaders should proceed. Yeah, obviously, like this comes up a lot, right? When people call out the occupation in Palestine, when people call out like apartheid, ethnic cleansing, the genocide in Gaza, there's a lot of pushback against all of those narratives, knowing that Almost every major international human rights organization and the UN have said this, have said that the, this there is an occupation and there is apartheid in Israel is important to acknowledge. And I think like people want self-determination for Palestinians, right? We know that Gaza before October wasn't amazing. It was obviously better than what's happening now, but it was still regarded as an open air prison. It was still regarded as freedom of movement being restricted, basically not allowing goods in and out freely. Um, restricting water and electricity. That was the reality of life there. And so I think acknowledging what's happening in Palestine and what has been happening for 76 years is important. I think with what's currently happening right now, when they say, when protesters are calling for an end to arms to Israel, right? That's seen as, oh, they want to dismantle the whole state. And I think what they're really saying also is, obviously there are people who, want a free Palestine. That's a major movement. But I think also what people are asking specifically from Kamala Harris right now, based on what she can do right now and call for at this moment, is withhold weapons, because that's the only thing that's going to stop what's happening in Gaza. As long as the U.S. continues sending these weapons and sending money and aid and military funding 
they are basically given the green light to continue killing innocent civilians in Gaza. That is the fact of the matter. There's no way this genocide continues without these weapons from the United States. And so the calls that are being made within the movement are specifically towards ending the genocide. There's another element to the movement that we also want an end to the occupation and we want an end to free Palestine. But I think the most urgent issue and the most important issue that's being pushed right now, and that's why we're seeing protests at the DNC, that's why we're seeing um, voters saying they're not going to come out unless this happens, is to end this genocide. Nora, is there anything that you would like to add to this conversation that we missed? I think there was one thing, Juan Diego, that you brought up. I didn't really address it, but you did talk about younger voters. That's uh, something I think we're thinking about a lot. Um, when I reported a, the a story for Latino USA, that also came up in our conversation because it was during the time of uh, the student encampments that we were seeing all across the country and even other parts of the world. And yeah, I think, you know, we're, we are seeing that younger voters are heavily engaged and that if they do come out in big numbers, that they can be super influential, like we saw that in the 2022 midterms. And so... You know, I think it's a demographic that the candidates should pay have heavy attention to. And I think polls showed that younger people do tend to sympathize with Palestinians more than older Americans. Um, I think that was from like Pew Research Center and that majority of Americans, not just young people, want a ceasefire. All of polling has shown that since the beginning of this. But yeah, I, I do think they are going to be very influential, but they need to be convinced to come out to vote. Um, and so, again, like I would say that the onus falls on the candidates to really listen to them and to really heed their calls. What I find so fascinating about that is it is a real shift and change. As we've talked about, the relationship between the United States and Israel has lasted many, many decades since the founding of, of the state of Israel. And I think for the first time, what these protests to me... Um, symbolize in so many ways is even if the change is not happening at the pace perhaps that that we would hope or want it to there is a generation of people of new voters of younger folks who are going to continue to be a part of american politics for the next 50 years who are asking for a shift to that relationship. And we've never seen that before. Following 9-11, um, we didn't see Muslim Americans or Arab Americans protesting in the ways that we see today. And I think that that's a real shift, right? Through our immigration system, the United States is changing. That's what this podcast is really all about. And the those shifts in what America looks like is leading to these kinds of changes in American politics in terms of our values, in terms of our relationships with other countries. And I think that's the really fascinating piece for me is that this there's so much and rightly attention on this issue now, but I really am curious to see how this continues to play out over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years um, as more and more generations change over and participate in U.S. politics. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you for actually bringing that up. Uh, again, thank you, Noor, for coming to uh, to talk to, with us to the podcast. Uh, where can we find you on socials? Thank you for having me. I'm on Twitter X <laughs> still, not as often. Yeah, at Noor. It's my name, Noor Saudi with the O at the end. So it's like a play on, on words because it's like audio because I'm an audio journalist. So it's Noor Saudi. <laughs> um, and my Instagram is Noor Nalism. So like journalism with an N instead of a J. So I share a lot on my feed and story there about what's happening in Gaza and just the election and my work and stuff. So you can find me there. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for listening to this episode of Nationly Podcast brought to you by Immigrantly Media. We hope you like this episode. Nationly releases weekly on Thursdays on all streaming platforms. If you have thoughts you'd like to share with us, please email them to info at immigrantlypod.com. Or reach out on our socials at Immigrantly Media on Instagram and at Immigrantly underscore pod on X. You can find me on Instagram or X at Sophia Hanale. And you can find me on socials at Juan DR. 47. Nationly is produced by Sadia Khan and me, Sofia Sanchez. Our sound designer and editor is Juan Velez. 
The Nationly theme music is by Simon Hutchinson. Additional music is by Epidemic Sound.